Well, let's look at Fourier representations. These are named after Joseph Fourier, who was a French mathematician and physicist that lived in the late 1700s and early 1800s. The basic idea behind Fourier representations is that we're going to look at ways of describing an arbitrary signal as a sum of sinusoids. And I use the term sum in a generic sense also referring to an integral because an integral is nothing more than a sum. Now why sinusoids? Sinusoids are pretty fundamental signals. They're fundamental in nature and for example if we take the electromagnetic spectrum we have signals that are sinusoidal of different frequencies including like light where each frequency maps to a different color and x-rays and then down in the frequency ranges like the gigahertz range where your cell phone operates and so on. Sinusoids also occur in nature with oscillatory motion like with a pendulum or with a spring mass system or if your shock absorbers are worn out in your car and um, frequency, the ideas of frequency pervade our experience as well. For example, we commonly talk about sounds as having high frequency or low frequency and it turns out that in your auditory system the mechanical structure of your auditory system separates out the sounds into different frequency bands that then are preserved all the way up into your auditory cortex. Now, there's a very powerful property that sounds a bit abstract and that is we can say that sinusoids are eigenfunctions of linear time invariant systems and this gives us an enormously powerful tool for signal processing and understanding representing signals and manipulating them. What this means is that if I take a sinusoid and I put a sinusoid say e to the j omega n as the input to a linear time invariant system and what I'm going to get out from that system is a sinusoid of the same frequency with just a constant multiplying in front of it and this constant can shift the amplitude and phase but a sinusoid of one frequency in gives a sinusoid of the same frequency out with possibly an amplitude and phase shift and this turns out to be an extremely powerful property for our analysis. We can also show as we go through this we'll see that a sum again also possibly an integral of sinusoids can represent any signal at least any signal that we would be interested in. Now there are four different Fourier representations depending on the whether a signal is continuous time or discrete time depending on whether it's periodic or non-periodic and I've laid these out in this, this chart here and so in this column here we have continuous time signals. For continuous time signals we have the Fourier transform when the signal is non-periodic and we'll denote that as x of t transforming to a signal x of omega through the Fourier transform. In the continuous time category we also have the Fourier series which is some continuous time signal transforming with a Fourier series and a fundamental period or frequency omega naught to x of k. And here omega naught is 2 pi over the period. So this is for periodic continuous time signals. If we have discrete time signals we can write down the discrete time Fourier transform which relates x of n to x of e to the j omega and we're going to use the e to the j omega notation here rather than just lowercase omega for consistency with the z transform when we get to that. And then if the discrete time signal is periodic we can have something called the discrete time Fourier series where x of n has period n and it converts to x of k with a fundamental frequency given by 2 pi over n. Now we've talked just about the time properties of these signals. Time here in terms of continuous discrete and time in terms of whether it's non-periodic or periodic. But it turns out these have duals in frequency. 
if I look at properties in frequency, signals which are continuous in time end up being non-periodic in frequency, and signals which are discrete in time end up being periodic in frequency, either 2 pi periodic, which would be the discrete time Fourier transform, or n periodic, which is the discrete time Fourier series. Similarly, signals which are non-periodic in time end up being continuous in frequency, which is why we have the parentheses notion here for the Fourier transform and the discrete time Fourier transform. Uh, if they are periodic in time, they end up being discrete, which is why we're using the index k. So these are the four Fourier representations, and although they apply to each individual category, it turns out that we can represent discrete time signals using a continuous time for a transform. We'll talk about how to do that. And there's reasons why we want to do that, especially when we're studying systems that involve sampling or reconstruction where there's a conversion from one to the other. So we will learn about how to go back and forth across these boundaries. So in this first slide here, we'll look at the Fourier transform. And I've just written the expression down so if I have a time signal x of t and want to find out its representation in frequency x of omega, I evaluate this particular integral, minus infinity to infinity, x of t e to the minus j omega t. Similarly, once I have the frequency domain representation x of omega, I can express the time domain representation x of t as integral minus infinity to infinity, 1 over 2 pi x of omega e to the j omega t t omega. I said we're looking at sums of sinusoids, and here we can think of the integral as a sum, and what we're adding up is x of omega over 2 pi times d of omega, and we're going to multiply that times e to the j omega t. So we can think about this as a weight being applied to the sinusoid e to the j omega t, and if I add those up, in a dense manner consistent with the sum transitioning to an integral over frequency, I get back the time signal. So I'm saying the time signal can be written as a weighted combination or weighted sum of sinusoids. Now in this case we have that the signal is continuous in time and omega. And both of these are defined on uh, t in the entire set of real numbers. Okay, so this, this is minus infinity to infinity for both t and omega. We can draw this pictorially, just to refresh your memory a little bit. Let's suppose I have a signal x of t, and x of t has some shape. I take Fourier transform of that, which we can do by evaluating the integral. What I'm going to get in frequency in general, this will be complex valued because we're integrating over complex sinusoids, but I'm going to draw it as if it's real for illustration, and we might have something, if you remember right, uh, rectangles in time transform to sync functions in frequency. So moving on to the discrete time Fourier transform, I've got the expressions here. We see that x of e to the j omega can be written as a sum minus infinity of x of n e to the minus j omega n. So this looks kind of like the Fourier transform, except here we have a sum instead of an integral, and these is a discrete time signal and discrete time sinusoid. Now the inverse discrete time Fourier transform going from frequency domain representation back to time involves 1 over 2 pi integral minus pi to pi x of e to the j omega e to the j omega, and d omega. So again, we have a superposition of, of sinusoids here. We're letting the integral approximate a sum here, since integrals are just adding things up on a dense grid. We'll have e to the j omega over 2 pi times d omega, and then that is a weight that's applied to the sinusoid e to the j omega n. Now in this case, sinusoids are, we're only integrating over the frequency range for omega minus pi to pi, and our time signal x of n is defined on 
n between minus infinity and infinity. In general, can have infinite support. Well, the reason that we only are integrating or only operating over a 2 pi integral of, interval of frequency is because of the properties of discrete time sinusoids. When you have a discrete time sinusoid, e to the j omega n, it turns out that I, if I shift omega by any multiple of 2 pi, I get exactly the same sinusoid. So what this means is that if I shift omega, in other words, x of e to the j omega plus some l times 2 pi, you can substitute into this expression and do a little bit of complex algebra and see that that's exactly equal to x of e to the j omega. Therefore, x of e to the j omega has period 2 pi. So it doesn't matter what x of n is, any discrete time Fourier transform is going to have be 2 pi periodic, and we typically work from minus pi to pi, sometimes 0 to 2 pi, but typically we use an interval minus pi to pi for convenience. So in this case, we've got x of n, some time signal, and we'll be abstract here rather than trying to make something that actually is true, so I'll draw x of n. And if I take a discrete time Fourier transform of x of n, make this axis omega, and we'll have x of e to the j omega here, this is going to be 2 pi periodic, so I'll mark some intervals on the axis here. And so let's suppose we have something like this. Well, that's going to repeat every 2 pi. Okay, so the discrete time Fourier transform is not periodic in the time domain, x of n, but it is periodic, 2 pi periodic, in the frequency domain. For signals that are periodic in the time domain, we start with the Fourier series for continuous time signals, and again, we're basically taking the signal, multiplying it by complex sinusoid with minus j omega t times frequency, and then we're going to integrate or sum, as we did in the previous case, against that complex sinusoid, and in this case normalized by the period t. On the other side, when we reconstruct our signal, we can say that x of t is a sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of the sinusoid multiplied by the Fourier series coefficient. So in this case, it's very clear that we have a weighted sum of sinusoids. x of k is the weight applied to the sinusoid e to the j k omega naught t. So this sinusoid has frequency k omega naught. So here we have a signal that's periodic in time and therefore to understand x of t we only need to know x of t on say an interval 0 to t. You could also use minus t over 2 to t over 2, depends on on the situation. And in general, x of k can have arbitrary indices for k on the integers. And so here we've got k equals uh, dot, 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 minus 2, minus 1, 0, and so on. So k is defined on the integers. So in this case, we have something which is periodic in time. This periodic time signal is going to have Fourier series coefficients, which we can draw on a discrete valued format. We'll call those x of k. And we'll make this 0, 1, 2, minus 1. So there's the corresponding Fourier series coefficients. Well, our final representation is the discrete time Fourier series. And this applies to signals x of n that have period n. And it turns out that the discrete time Fourier series coefficients, x of k, are just 1 over n times the sum of the signal multiplied by the sinusoid with the complex conjugate, or the negative j in the exponential, summed over one period, very analogous to the Fourier series. And then the signal itself can be expressed as a weighted sum of sinusoids, where x and k, again, are the weights 
that are applied to a sinusoid, e to the j, k, omega naught, n, and this sinusoid has frequency, k, omega naught. And the units on that are going to be in radians, since uh, n is dimensionless as, as being samples. In this case, we have periodic in time, so that means that x of n is only meaningful or, or only needs to be defined over one period, say 0 to n minus 1. And similarly, for x of k, it also ends up being periodic, so we only need to define it on one period. And uh, again, you can choose these periods to be symmetric if you wish or whatever is convenient. So that's the discrete time Fourier series. Now an important version of the discrete time Fourier series or, or variation that we're going to look at extensively later on is the discrete Fourier transform or the DFT. And the DFT involves actually from an equation standpoint the only thing that happens is we move the 1 over n from here over to the other side. But it turns out that this is a computational tool that we'll use because none of these none of the other forms can be actually computed in a digital computer because they either require an infinite number of samples or a, uh, are continuous in one variable or the other. Okay, this one is discrete in both variables and we can do it using a finite number of samples. So this is the only one we're going to end up computing.